Alec Murdoch is a man accused of the ultimate betrayal, shooting and killing his wife Maggie and his son Paul. They are allegations which shocked the people in the low country of South Carolina. That's because of Alec's last name, Murdoch, a name which has wielded power and influence over criminal prosecutions in this part of South Carolina for over 100 years. But now Alec is inside the historic Culleton County Courthouse in the small southern town of Walterboro, trying to convince the jury he is not a cold-blooded killer who would murder his own flesh and blood. Tonight, the defense is wrapping up their case, finishing with Alec's brother John Marvin taking the stand. Will his words resonate with the jury and help convince them Alec is a family man who is living through a horrific tragedy, losing his wife and son and then being falsely accused of their murder? Or is it too little, too late? We are live from the courthouse with all the big moments as the trial the nation is watching gets closer to a final verdict. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. Great to have you aboard. We are live in Colton County, Colton County, South Carolina. Walterboro is the name of the city. The courthouse behind us, a warm breeze. Uh, we are here. We're locked down, folks. Until this jury gets the case and returns a verdict, we're not leaving town. We're going to stay here. So. Our coverage of this case, we've called the Murdoch Family Murders. And, and the reason being, this is all about family. All about family. And the key to this case is understanding the dynamics in the family and what was happening in the family and whether or not the ultimate betrayal took place. Now, when you talk about the Murdochs in this case, you're talking about two dead Murdochs, Maggie and Paul. And it's extremely tragic, extremely tragic. Especially, we've heard the order of death, we believe, was Paul first and then Maggie. That's what prosecutors are arguing. That's what they say the evidence um, determines. So think about Maggie's last moment on earth, knowing that her son was shot and killed. Whether her husband is or is not the killer, that is a horrible way to end your life as a parent, knowing that your youngest son is dead. Now, for Paul Murdoch, um, this was a point of his life. There was a lot of controversy going on. He was a criminal defendant himself. He was in a lot of trouble. There was a lot of things going on. Uh, but despite all of that, um, a young person should get to live their life. Just like Mallory Beach deserved to live her life, uh, Paul Murdoch did as well, and he's gone. So two dead Murdochs. You've got one Murdoch who's accused, and that's Alec. This is a father accused of murdering his own son and the, and, and the mother of his two children. And this is, I mean, again, we get back to that name Murdoch. This is a family that seemingly, from everything we've learned, looks out for one another, that takes care of one another. They clean up each other's messes. They don't create messes like this. But that's what he's accused of, right? You've got uh, Maggie and, and Paul had his troubles, and, and we've heard evidence that Alec was doing everything he could to try to clear his son's name. Obviously, Maggie would be doing the same thing. But he's accused of murdering both of them. Now, let's take it one step further here and, and what we've seen during the course of this trial. Because you've got Murdoch's as victims, Murdoch as a defendant. So who are the Murdoch's supporting here? Who are they supporting? I think it's Murdoch's for the defense. Absolutely. Despite the fact that Paul and Maggie dead many times, almost all the time, when, when, you've, when you've got family members who are killed, you, as a family member, come to that courtroom, you sit behind the prosecutor, you support the prosecution, and you're hoping for justice. But that's not the case in this case. No way. They're there supporting Alec because they don't believe he's guilty. Or if they do believe he's guilty, they want him to get away with it. But from the testimony, everything we've seen and heard, 
it, it seems genuine that they don't believe he did it or they don't want to believe that he did it. Not unusual for a family member to support a family member, but sometimes in cases where a family member is the victim, you see that happen. But not happening here. And here as we get close to the end of the defense case, they call to the stand another Murdoch, John Marvin, Alex's brother. Smart man, super bright, very sort of personable, like we've heard Alec described, but I think he's not as rough around the edges. Like Alec was, despite the fact that Alec's a lawyer, success, all that, he's, he's a little rougher around the edges in, in the way he communicates. John Marvin, his brother, seems a little smoother. I mean, almost strikes me as more of a, I don't want to, disparage him and call him a politician, but sort of as a pol the way a politician can kind of um, make you feel very comfortable very quickly. And I've seen him do it inside the courtroom with different people and came across as a very sincere witness today for the defense. Let's take a look. Ellick called me and, and just absolutely hysterical. Um, as soon as I heard his voice, I knew something bad was going on. He was just broken, I mean, distraught. I mean, everybody was. There were a few other people there, but but he just, all we did is hugged and cried. I mean, we didn't, I don't even know that we talked. I saw blood, I saw brains, I saw pieces of skull. Or, and, and when I say brains, it, it could just be tissue. I, I don't know what I was seeing. It was just, it was terrible. I can promise you, no mother or father or aunt or uncle should ever have to see and do what I did that day. I don't know, I, I, I'm not blaming anybody, but it's just, it, I was just overwhelmed. I, I did everything I could. Powerful, that's powerful testimony. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at him, I'm listening to him, extremely emotional, but it comes across, and I believe was, very sincere. I mean, he was there and he saw his nephew's brains splattered everywhere. Now, regardless of who the killer is here, that moment is difficult. And, and that came across in the courtroom. But I think the defense wants to use that to try to say, listen, the Murdochs are supporting the Murdochs. This is a tough thing. An uncle is heartbroken. His, his father couldn't have done it. His father wouldn't have done it. I think that's where we are. Hey, I want to bring in... Uh, Chanley Painter, Court TV legal correspondent. She's sitting next to me right here. Chanley, great to see you. Steve, any welcome back. It's not, we're outside. That's right. You know, one of the reasons that we went to Fat Jack's, besides the great food and, and the yes, great people, yes. uh, was also when I was first here, the weather was a little dicey. This is a nice beautiful. southern night. This is why people move here. It's why people live here. Absolutely beautiful. But let's let's talk about what happened inside that courtroom today with John Marvin. Yes. Um, he talked about, and what, how did he describe the relationship? Because again, this is about family to me, that relationship between father and son, Alec and Paul. Absolutely, and family in the courtroom. This is a witness the jury has seen in the gallery of this entire trial for weeks. Uh, John Marvin, as you said, this gregarious person who is affable, like, watch him inside the, the courtroom. Room. He works, oh, he the, works room. the room. He works the room. A sincerely genuine person. And he came across like that on the witness stand, Vinny. Um, he captivated the entire courtroom. The jurors leaned in. He had moments of levity where they laughed with him. And then one seemed to grab a tissue and dab her eyes at moments when he became emotional, talking about Paul. Uh, John Marvin had a special relationship with his nephew, Paul. Uh, Paul worked for him at the time of his murder. And he also talked about the relationship his brother Alec had with Paul and Maggie. He became emotional during that as well. He talked about the moment that Alec called him hysterical after finding the bodies, allegedly. And again, uh, with Paul, it was that moment where he really broke down on the stand. Let's watch. How well did you know Paul? I knew Paul very well. Um, excuse me, I'm gonna have a hard time talking about Paul because we had a very special relationship. But I knew him very well. And I'll, I'll do my best to, to answer any questions about him. Well, did he have a nickname? Uh, 
He did. They, they called him Little Rooster. And um, did they call him anything else? Well, I mean, he'd been called Little Rooster. He'd been called, as you heard, Paw Paw. I mean, that's what my family, my kids called him. There's a lot of nicknames that we're learning in this testimony. And, and Paul, Paul, that's important Paul, Paul. because that's what Alec was saying over and over again on the witness stand. Exactly. So you could just feel you know, the heaviness of his testimony, bringing Paul to life, Maggie, and humanizing Alec, another witness on the stand uh, from the defense. The, I think the more you make this feel like a, like a real family, right. not characters, but like a real family, I think it's effective. And in the gallery, Benny, uh, they were echoing that emotion. You know, they moved back a couple rows, but you have, you know, Lynn and Randy was there today with his wife, and they were all passing tissues uh, throughout yeah. John Marvin's testimony. Big moment for them. Um, all right. He also testified about Maggie's phone. Yes. And this is one of those pieces of evidence I still don't understand. I don't know if anyone understands why that phone ended up where it ended up. Um, but he had a big part in, in, in finding it. He did, and this was this was interesting uh, moment in the courtroom because you could sense his passion for what happened in this story when he had this, what he thought was a huge discovery. He found possibly a key piece of evidence, as we know, and he didn't feel like the law enforcement officers echoed that sense of urgency that he felt. Let's take a listen to that part. I went to Buster, and... Um Sure enough, he, I said, Buster, do you have this one of these apps like they're talking about? And he said, yeah, sure I do. I said, well, open it up. He opened it up and he handed me the phone and I see Maggie's name and I press it where, you know, to activate it. And it pings Maggie's phone just out front of the property. And I was like, I, I, I hate to say it, but I said, holy <laughs> there it is. And I said, Buster, I'm taking your phone. I'm going to go back down to the to the shed and show it to law enforcement. I went up to, the, to a sled agent and, or two sled agents and said, presumably sled agents, and said, hey, I've got Buster's phone here and it, it's got an app on it that can find the phone and it's showing Maggie's phone's right out here. Let's, um, y'all wanna let's go get it. And he said, no need. We have technology coming later today that we should be able to find it. And it just, it blew me away that I'm sitting here showing them where Maggie's phone is, but they won't take the time to walk with me or take this phone itself. I mean, I'd give them the phone to go find it. So again, he was integral in finding Maggie's phone, Benny, uh, he, but a lot of pieces of the investigation he was integral with. He was there when they searched Moselle. He was there if they ever needed anything. So uh, it was interesting and smart, probably, choice that they culminated the defense case with him. Yeah, and, and you talk about the SLED agents and the relationship with the Murdochs. They're trying to paint SLED as the enemy here. They're the outsiders, the enemy, and that was a prime example. And I can see Harpootlian jumping on that in his closing argument, talking about the fact, well, they had a big piece of evidence, but they didn't want to hear anything from the Murdochs because they were already focused on what they were focused on. Fascinating. Um, now, let's talk about the two-shooter theory because that came up inside this courtroom again today. It's been a while since we heard it, but it could be a significant argument for the defense. Oh, absolutely. Ever since opening statement, I mean, they've been putting this theory out there, and today they brought in an expert, uh, a very experienced expert, uh, to come in and talk about why he believed that it would make more sense that more than one shooter was involved, and I thought it was pretty interesting. Let's listen. With Paul, I, as I articulated, I, I believe he was shot first. I believe he had no idea it was coming. Um, and, and he took the shot to the chest and, and very soon thereafter, the one in the back of his head. Anybody in the near proximity to that, if Maggie had been anywhere in that area walking around down there, she would have heard that. Um, and, and her response would have been in the direction of the shooter or the activity or, or run or do something different. So I think that the temporal location suggests that these things more probable than not happened fairly quickly and, and that uh, and that the individual who shot first with the shotgun minimally was stunned, probably blood and material in his eyes, and maybe had been injured, and, and would have taken some degree of time to recover. 
And lastly, I think there is just a more or less, uh, uh, in, the, in the, anybody who deals with firearms, a logical argument here. Why would you bring, why would one shooter bring two long rifles, two long weapons to the event? You can't handle and shoot two of them. So you either got to put one down, use one, or, and then swap out and grab the other one. Or I suppose you could have one on a sling, but that's quite awkward and it's slipping around and it's banging around in an environment we know is very, is very, very tight. All right, I get it. You wouldn't bring two guns there, but what if the two guns were already there and you grabbed one and then there was no ammo and then you grabbed the other and then you finished the job on your second victim? I think that's what the prosecution would say, but I, what do I know? What do I know? I just host this show uh, uh, here on, on Court TV. Hey, by the way, someone who knows a lot about this now joins Chanley and me, Matt Harris, host of the Murdoch Family Murders Impact of Influence podcast. Here we are. Yeah. I don't have any food for you tonight. We're not no, at Fat I'm Jack's. Here. Yeah, but, <laughs> uh, thanks for coming. What do you think of, of today? Like uh, John Marvin on the stand. John Marvin, no offense attorneys, but one of the best things he did was say, I'm not an attorney. <laughs> he separated himself from the Murdoch family almost and became more of this, this guy who does heavy machinery and he rents machinery. I thought that was really important because I think that it made him less of the... Now just say it. It okay. made him more credible right, because yes. he's not a lawyer. He That's what Matt is saying I'm trying tonight. to say he's a lot less slimy. <laughs> <laughs> So no, but it, it, I think it helps you know with regular folk. You know what I'm exactly. saying? Exactly. And it really, it really resonated. And also, uh, the story he was telling about the phone, he told us on the podcast six months ago, eight months ago. It's been very consistent. And uh, his ending was brilliant too. Uh, that when they when they said to him about you know, are you really worried or concerned about your family name? And he says, well, I'd be mean, no more concerned than you know you would be at your name. And he looks at the jury and he's like, or y'all's names. It was, it was, did you feel it, Chinley, yes. that was like pretty there important? There were jurors who nodded back at that moment. Right, right, so it was good. Maybe he should be a lawyer. <laughs> Maybe he should, but I mean, it, he's, he was so strong. Yes. Yeah. So strong inside that court. So ultimately, you know, we look at this case and I start off by saying the Murdoch family murders. It's an unusual dynamic because the victims and the defendant are all in the same immediate family and, um, do you think the victims in this case have been played sympathetically to the jury? Like, to a certain extent, I kind of get it. I almost feel like Maggie's getting lost in the shuffle. Is it just me, or is Maggie getting lost in the shuffle in all this? You know, that's interesting you say that, because I felt that she's been lost in the shuffle from the get-go. When we started doing the podcast just a week or two after the murders, no, uh, none of Maggie's family members spoke, have spoken publicly. There's not a lot of stories being told. We've we tried to get people to talk about Maggie and tell stories about Maggie, and they just weren't out there. And I'm uh, not sure. I understand why your family would want to keep, keep things down low, but uh, it is, I agree, that's an interesting take, because I agree with you. That okay. she's been lost. I said something good. You, you say a lot of good things, <laughs> man. All right, Matt staying with us, Chanley staying with us. We're also going to get down to the uh, Battle of the Pathologist, which is taking place, plus coming up next hour. On the docket tonight, the tragic disappearance of little Harmony Montgomery, missing since 2019, but not reported missing until 2021. Then in 2022, her father arrested for her murder. And tonight, a preview of his upcoming trial on Court TV. Specifically, Mr. Montgomery has been charged with the following four crimes. Second degree murder for recklessly causing the death of Harmony Montgomery. Budding romance allegedly cut short by a jealous ex-boyfriend. But can prosecutors prove their case without a body? The obsessed ex-boyfriend murder trial. Live coverage this week following jury selection on Court TV. A divorced dad visits his kids and ends up dead. But that's only the beginning. Immediately it was suspicious. You can't make that up. Someone they knew with Tamron Hall. All new episode Sunday, 9, 8 central. On For sensitive skin. I'm an expert on the directionality within the body that um, projectiles 
go, entrance, exit, the direction within the body. You've given an opinion that Dr. Reamer was wrong on the shot that blew um, Paul's brain out of his skull and it landed on the ground, correct? That's correct. All right, we've got some disagreement amongst experts. Uh-oh, not the first time, folks. Not the first time in a, in a big a murder trial that experts from the two sides don't agree with one another. But this is, this is kind of interesting because what they uh, disagree about is from which direction Paul Murdoch was shot with that fatal uh, shotgun shot. I mean, I don't know if I've ever covered a trial where they disagree about the direction of the fatal shot. But let's take a listen first to the state expert and then the defense expert. So there was a large shotgun wound defect to the top of his left shoulder. And um, there were a lot of pellets recovered in the left shoulder area. And from there, the um, it kind of just went across the top of the left shoulder and then went into the left side of the neck and face. Okay. And from there, his face actually was not destroyed from this, but there's a big exit wound on the top of the right side of the head. So this wound went from his left toward his right and upward and with a slight front to back deviation. So the other shot resulted in his head exploding? Correct. Okay, explain to the jury what she said and then what you believe, uh, and we'll talk about why the difference is in just a minute. Okay? Sure. So um, in her autopsy report, uh, she stated that she believed the entrance was coming from the left side went up and then it exited the top of the head. Um, to me, this is a contact range gun, uh, shotgun wound to the top of the head that caused extreme pressure buildup in the head from it being contact, leading to these types of fractures and that the pellets, so the, the shotgun wound comes in the um, wadding will start to open up. All of that pressure basically, for lack of a better term, will explode um, what's there because the pressure needs to get out somehow. And then the head would have been down like this and the pellets lodged here and went into the left shoulder. And then you can see that the pellets are going down into the tissues of the left shoulder. Okay, so when you look at the wound um, in his shoulder and his neck, and of course, his head. Tell us where Dr. Reamer got it wrong. Well, I think she has it reversed. And the reason being is, um, n now that you've seen where all the pressure would go, if, if the entrance wound is here on the left shoulder, and we're saying that we're at least three to four feet away from there because we have no soot, we have no stippling on the skin, then by the time it gets to the left side of the chin or over here at the, the angle of the mandible, the jaw, we've lost a lot of energy. And so yes, you can get some pellets still going up into the head, but you're not going to have the top of the head completely blown off. And if you look at the photograph here, you can see you know, for all of us, it curves over and goes around because the top of our skull is there. If you look here, it goes flat. He's missing the top of his skull. That, that would not have happened from a three to four foot, three or four, I should say three feet or further shotgun wound coming in on the left side. All right. For years here on Court TV, when we've had this exact situation, a battle of the experts inside the courtroom where the prosecution expert says one thing and then the defense expert literally now says something the exact opposite. I need an independent voice. 
I need, I need like a voice of reason here. Someone who's definitely not getting paid because we're not giving her any money tonight. Let's bring in Dr. Laura <laughs> Petler. Uh, she should be getting paid though for all her time with us. Death investigator, forensic criminologist uh, in Monroe, North Carolina. Uh, Dr. Laura, should I swear you in first or should we just <laughs> uh, trust your, your point of view? What's going on here? Why can't two experts like this agree on, on the direction of the shot, of the fatal shot? Vinny, this is common among forensic pathologists, and I know that sounds crazy, but it actually is. I have seen two pathologists stand in the same room autopsying one body, and they disagree on directionality, and they have different opinions, so it's, it's very common. I've seen it throughout my career. All right, so th does one of the two make more sense to you? Then, then the other, based upon your experience and, and your years in, in, in studying this stuff and, and uh, watching these pathologists testify, I mean, I, I get it. I get one side, you know, works for the state, is paid by the state, just like the other side is paid by the defense. All that's even, even Stephen, right? So does one make right. more sense to you? I personally thought uh, Dr. Reimer's explanation made more sense just because I'm taking into consideration the totality of the evidence and, and not just the body because that's my job as a forensic criminologist. So um, from the standpoint of the first blast to the chest and then, you know, just thinking of the body just moving in a natural motion, um, it, then the, it follows with a second blast to the, the left side of the body. To me, that personally made more sense, but I have not worked the case or seen the file or was present for the autopsy. So I can only go off of what we're hearing here in testimony. Yeah, so when we have this battle of the experts, some people say it's a wash and you have to look at the other evidence and you have to look at some of the other uh, testimony and what makes common sense. All right, right. so a lot of this is important because it, it has to do with uh, blood spatter and the spatter yes. of brain material and tissue, yes. et cetera. So let's take a listen to a little bit of testimony relative to that to see if it clears anything up tonight. After you took a shower, what did you change into? I changed into the clothes that you've seen in this trial, shorts and the shirt. Did you get on your shirt high velocity blood spatter from being within a distance of a shooting Maggie or Paul? There's no way that I had high velocity blood spatter on me. Had you seen reports that said that at one point in time? I have seen reports that said that. Just to be clear, were you anywhere in the vicinity when Paul and Maggie were shot? I was nowhere near Paul and Maggie when they got shot. How would you describe the defendant's hands when you saw him when you were interviewing him? How would you describe his hands? They were clean. Clean. How would you describe his arms? They were clean. How would you describe his t-shirt? Clean. How would you describe his shorts? Clean. How would you describe his shoes? They were clean. He's clean. So uh, obviously what the defense is saying, yeah, you know, he would have been close. He would have been filled with all this uh, uh, tissue, brain matter, etc. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Laura, as you look at this case, again, big picture, all the way, yep. pull all the way back. Um, mm -hmm. The fact that he appears clean that night, w w where, where does that lead us? What's the conclusion we should take from that? Or is it still a little confusing? You know, I think that uh, it can be confusing depending on which position you're taking on the case. Uh, I think that the, in the totality of evidence, we know that the shotgun, the shotgun blast and the other blast, uh, at least the shotgun blast was at a close range within three feet. Blood spatter, specifically high velocity impact spatter, does not travel more than three feet. But you're talking, Vinny, about minute. When you're talking about high velocity, you're talking about blood stains, spheroids of blood that are like one millimeter in size. They can be a little bigger, but then 
you know, with a shotgun, you're going to have a variation in the distribution of blood stains. So it's very possible that other types of blood and, and body kind of fluids and things like that do get on a shooter at three feet away. But in this particular case, uh, the, the sled agent, she testified that he was clean. His hands were clean. His clothes were clean. So... In, that, in my opinion, you know, if they didn't find HVIS, high velocity impact spatter on, on his shirt, it, that would make sense with her saying that it's clean. And I think that he took a shower and he admits that. And I think there's a fiber of truth in the thread of every lie. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Dr. Laura Petler, we should be paying you for all the help you've been giving us. Thank, <laughs> Thank you so you, much. Vinny. We'll speak Thanks again really, me. really soon. Thank you. When we come back, I was uh, strolling through downtown Walterboro today, bumped into a guy who knows Cousin Eddie, told me an incredible story. We have that, plus, coming up next hour. In the low country of South Carolina, Alec Murdoch trying desperately to convince the jury he's not a killer. He took the stand last week, and today, it was his brother, John Marvin. As soon as I heard his voice, I knew something bad was going on. Didn't know what. I think he said, uh, Maggie and Paul have been hurt really badly. Please get here as fast as you can. The trial that America is watching. Disbarred lawyer Alec Murdoch is accused of shooting his son Paul and his wife Maggie. They're on the ground out at my kennel. Prosecutors say a financial house of cards was collapsing around him. Financial, digital, and forensic evidence. It looked like he had stolen. A big trial in a small southern town. Ow, ow. It did it so bad. The Murdoch Family Murders. Live coverage weekday mornings at 8, 7 central on CourtTV.com. There's the clock at the Farmers Merchants Bank in the middle of Main Street in Walterboro. This is small town America, folks. I mean, like, really small. You walk down here, you'll see some antique stores. They've got like two or three featuring some collectibles that you can purchase that people buy and sell. Um, also, when you walk down the street, it's very narrow. It's very beautiful also, but very quiet. I've driven this street at night also, and it's just no one is here. But this is it. This is Walterboro. Like, you want to go for a tour of the whole town? You're looking at the whole town. Main Street is the main event. And again, you look over, there's a couple shops. We passed a, a barber shop back there. You've got the Chamber of Commerce over here. And also, you've got some spas, some good living in the low country. As a matter of fact, I think we counted three spas on Main Street, and they've got a couple restaurants, and two of them are Italian, believe it or not. The Bear Cafe, serving a nice lunch, but also featuring some hookah. It's 2023, Walterboro's, you know, with the rest of the country. It's just everything smaller, quieter, much more quaint, and you get to the end of Main Street, and then you've got the big show, folks, the big show. This is your courthouse, where the biggest trial in the nation is now taking place. So I was strolling through Walterboro today, and, you know, I said this is a, a big, big trial in a small town. And it's small like the street and, you know, how geographically it is, but it's also small and everyone's connected. And I bump into a guy named Pat. He's now my friend, Pat Hamilton. Turns out Pat knows Cousin Eddie and had a pretty interesting Cousin Eddie story. Take a listen. Uh, he was just a normal normal guy, a uh, new customer I'd never seen before. So every other week when I would do an auction, Eddie would always come to the sales. And he would always buy stuff, and he'd bring his wife with him. And it, Totally normal guy. Totally normal guy. And at that time, the antique business was still kind of hot. And... Uh, that, I think they had some dealer spaces set up in other stores, or, you know, like antique shops or something, because of the volume of merchandise. So he's buying and selling he antiques. And, you know, cause Cousin Eddie's an antiquer. Yeah, because you come to an auction, you're buying stuff at wholesale. You right. know, so there's enough room to put it out on retail. And it was like a game him and his wife did together. All right. And so uh, that went on for a couple of years, and then Eddie came in one day, and he had a big brace on his front, and 
a brace on his back and I think one on his leg. And uh, I said, what in the world happened to you? You know, before auction, I was getting ready for the auction. And he said, man, I got in a real bad wreck, Pat. And no. he's, he said, uh, and I ain't finished with it yet, you know. And he said, I, I, I got limited movement with what I can do and all. And, and, uh, and I got me a new truck. I got a new F-150 because it was part of my settlement, but they're not through with it yet. But I didn't. Wait, wait, wait. So Cousin Eddie gets into a wreck. He got an Gets a big wreck. settlement. Right. And now he's got the F-150 he and his life changes a little bit? Yeah, I mean, he was the same guy. I couldn't notice anything different. But he wasn't buying the volume of merchandise he used to buy, you know. And, and then he kept, he would come and he wouldn't have his wife with him. So I didn't know what had happened with that. You know, I never knew it was being a drug dealer or, or anything like that. Uh, I never knew of a relationship he had with the Murdochs or nothing because he didn't discuss his, who was representing him or anything. He just told me he'd been in a bad automobile wreck. All right. So I know what you're thinking, right? You're look, uh, I'm six feet tall. You're looking at Pat. And you're just like, I checked. He has an alibi, folks. He has an alibi for June 7th. His wife was with him. She verified it. So he's clean. But thanks so much, Pat Hamilton, uh, giving us that story. Uh, fascinating stuff about Cousin Eddie, who is uh, the witness I think we all wanted to hear from that we haven't heard from. Let me bring back in Chanley Painter, Court TV legal correspondent, and Matt Harris, host of the Murdoch Family Murders Impact of Influence podcast. All right, so th in, in this case, it's been pretty amazing. But the one disappointment, I think, for a lot of people is we haven't heard from Cousin Eddie because we really want to know what his relationship was with Alec. Absolutely. I was hoping they, they would call him. Somebody would call Cousin Eddie to the stand and have him talk. Because what story would he tell this time on the witness stand? Uh, but it doesn't look like it's going to happen. Yeah, I don't. I d doubt that uh, the prosecution was... <laughs> no rebuttal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be really... A little dangerous. <laughs> yes, you don't know what the answer is going to be. See, 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 this is the difference between me and the attorneys who are trying the case, right? I want to get to the truth. Nothing but the truth. And, and, and the way to the truth, I think, is to hear from more of the people involved in his life, which is why I love that Alec Murdoch testified. The jury gets to judge his credibility. We heard from John Marvin. We heard from Buss. Let's hear from the people who are involved. We heard all about this roadside shooting, mm -hmm. but we haven't heard about the man who allegedly pulled the trigger. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, he's told a couple of different stories. So well, what were they? What were the two stories? What are the, the two stories he's told? Well, he, he said that uh, he didn't shoot him, that, the, that he that it missed or whatever, but Alec was shot. But I guess it's possible Eddie didn't know he hit him or maybe a ricochet or something. I don't know. Um, and he said that Alec called him out there. At one point, he said they called him out there like, to help him fix the truck or something. Right, and then eventually became to pay it, money. But I'd also like to hear about the forty to sixty thousand dollars a week, and and the money that was. Yes, that's again, a big one. At the heart of this case is uh, the, the, obviously the lying, the financial crimes. But where's all the money going? Why does Alec Murdoch need all this money to live? Here, I mean, this is a beautiful place, but you can do very well on a million dollars a year. Yeah. I think you could do pretty well here, and you could do well anywhere in a million dollars. Right. But you could do really yeah. well.